This is a recording of a presentation given to the Bundaberg IT professionals in March 2019. It's titled VR the way of the future, VR the way to the future. Hopefully you attended and this is just used for reference, but if you're watching this for the first time, well, that's great too. So let's start by defining what virtual reality is. Now some may say, well, it's right there in the title. A virtual, some sort of virtual construct that's trying to mimic reality. And in general, that's true. A lot of times when we're thinking of virtual reality, though, we're thinking of donning a headset or putting on some sort of computer equipment. And that's really the mechanics. Virtual reality is trying to achieve something slightly different. When we don a headset, what we're trying to do is actually immerse our senses in what this new world is all about. Uh, the headset itself is trying to display a visual appearance of what the new world is. We may have some audio from what the, what the new world is. You may also even have maybe tactile feedback of how you're interacting with this new world. So that part of it, the mechanics, is about immersing the senses, flooding the senses with what this new world is like, to really to try to trick us to be able to believe that we're actually there. So the immersion part is quite important, but it's actually trying to get us towards that presence, which is a feeling of being there. The whole point of virtual reality is to try to make you believe and think that you're actually in that reality in this alternate reality, in this virtual reality. So the holy grail of virtual reality is really getting that sense, that feeling of being there. Using immersion to be able to flood the senses is not a new concept to try to get us to feel present in somewhere else. In fact, back here is a picture of a filing, a patent uh, back in the 1960s, a sensor armor simulator and you can sort of see that this person has their head uh, inside of a box to be able to occlude out anything else from the real world. Uh, they get to see what's happening in front of them. The chair itself rumbles and moves, and they even have olfactory senses, so they can actually squirt perfumes and, and different smells into this space for them to be able to really feel like they're there, flooding the senses. As computers started to enter the mix, a slight change happened is that you could then start preparing a different scenario, a different screen to what uh, was scripted. Uh, the computer can actually figure out what is happening in terms of space and, um, and your position in the world, and then start to present that screen to uh, the person. You can see here somebody wearing a massive headset. Uh, this is back in about the 80s, early 80s. Um, it's obviously a fire pilot just learning in the simulator. So the headset is trying to once again occlude what's happening in the real world and replace that with what's happening inside of the virtual world. But they're, get, they're also getting feedback uh, from the from the yoke and even from the seat. The position of the of this fighter pilot is actually quite important, and the seat is giving them that feedback to say guess what, you're almost the same as if you're in a real um, a real cockpit and even the instrumentation and so forth allows them to be able to add that sense of reality. So even though the demonstration models of the mid to late 80s weren't that great, uh, it seemed obvious that eventually we will have enough computing power to be able to present a real world in front of our eyes and to be able to immerse our senses to be able to get us to escape to um, a virtual reality. Um, or, as William Gibson had coined the term, the cyberspace. I read uh, Neuromancer back in high school, and there certainly seemed to be a sense of, of wonder and awe about virtual reality, what it could do. Ah, this is going to be this is going to be great. This is going to be the future. So as I headed off to uni, um, VR was one of my favourite topics, and in fact, at university, there was a new program called ICQ where you had to enter a nickname, and my nickname at the time was VR Bones. VR obviously for virtual reality, and Bones was just my previous nickname. We also, uh, when we set up. Uh, an email account for the university, you had to write a signature block. My signature block at the time was the statement below, VR, the way of the future, 
the other way to the future. In that statement, I tried to uh, bring forth something that I thought was was uh, fundamental to me. The first VR, the way of the future, it seemed to me quite obvious. VR is going to be big, it's going to be huge, it's going to be everywhere, um, and it's going to be the way of the future. Uh, we'll eventually have a time and place where we see VR the same as maybe a TV or so. Uh, donning a headset and entering a virtual space would just be as natural to us as walking out the living room and turning on the TV, you know, or engaging with somebody else across the world uh, via a mobile phone or whatever. The second statement though, VR the way to the future, was trying to capture something about VR. Like with the ability to create any space at all inside of virtual reality, there are going to be ways that we can actually get to the future uh, by learning and by developing things that can only be done inside of virtual reality. So VR not only is the way of the future, it will bring about um, a future that we can only get to through virtual reality. And I'll touch on that a little bit later on. So VR the way of the future. It certainly seemed to be that it was coming, but maybe 10 to 15 years away until it really got settled and replacing something like a TV in a house. There were some problems holding it back and probably the first one really obvious is computer graphics. At the time, this is like early to mid nineties, uh, computer graphics for anything 3D was really just wireframe graphics. And you had to suspend your disbelief a little bit to be able to try to um, interpret those wireframe 3D graphics as, as a real um, as a real world in front of you. But give it enough time and the computing power keeps on increasing. Eventually we should be able to have 3D worlds that we can walk around in. Eventually we should have uh, the 3D world, the, the visual capacity of seeing the same type of vision as looking out a window. So that really should be just a matter of time. Just give it 10, 15 years and we should be there. There were some other issues though. Positional tracking, uh, the sensors that we were using to actually try to track um, the head movement and even like the position of the body in the space uh, weren't that great. But it surely is just a matter of time. Like give it 10 to 15 years, someone, some bright spark's gonna be able to figure this out. One of the um, hidden dangers though was latency. Latency is just the time it takes for you to be able to do something in the real world and for it to be uh, reacted and displayed into your headset or, or giving any sort of feedback. Um, now latency happens all the way along the entire path. For example, as soon as you move your head, the positional tracking needs to pick up very, very quickly that the head is now changed and is now facing a different direction. It then needs to transmit that to the computer. The computer needs to process that and then alter the the space, the, the vision, and then send that through to the graphics card, send that back up to the headset, and then for the headset to be able to display that um, that new vision. Now, our brains are actually quite quick at perceiving what is real and what is not real. And the latency that you're trying to aim at is like less than a millisecond or two. If it's not there, you get a, a sense of lag and it really disrupts that sense of presence. It detracts from the feeling of being there because you start feeling like you're operating like a uh, you're operating a joystick, and then you're seeing a simulation happening. You know, later on, uh, you get used to the mechanics of operating the joystick, but it's not the same feeling as being there. Added to latency is also network latency. VR is going to be great as a single player or a single um, user experience. Uh, but eventually we'll need to have VR networked with everything else. And certainly at the time, back in the, back in the early 90s and, and mid 90s, having anything go faster than 100 milliseconds across uh, the internet was just unheard of, unless if it was just a local network. Uh, so VR, a lot of the promises of having VR in the interconnected world, our cyberspace as it were, we'd really need to start dealing with network latency. And there are some, uh, real challenges there too. For example, the speed of light getting from somewhere like England over to here is still 0.6 of a, uh, 0.6 of a millisecond. Uh, all of the different nodes where that uh, fibre is going to go through. 
all take off their piece of time. So yes, it's going to get better and better and better, but there may actually be a top end where the latency is still insurmountable. And that might mean that we have some sort of localized version. But once again, these, you know, give it 10 to 15 years, maybe network latency would um, get better. At the time, I hadn't realized it, but there were some other issues that were coming. And one of them was, was locomotion. If it, if I am in a real environment, it feels like I'm um, out playing football. What's stopping me running 100 meters that way? Well, if I'm strapped to a computer with a headset, the headset's certainly not going to like that. Um, and even if I could keep running 100 meters that way, uh, what happens if I have physical space? For example, I'm going to run into a wall. I'm going to, uh, you know, I'm not going to have the space available to be able to do that. So locomotion eventually becomes an, an issue. How do I actually uh, move around in a virtual space without actually moving around in the real space? Um, and you could kind of think treadmills and all that sort of stuff. And yep, they're great, but they're coming. It's not here now, it's coming. There was another problem though, as well as that early models of VR, and especially um, the really cheap ones like this Nintendo Virtual Boy that came out at about mid 90s, they made you sick. Uh, very, very similar to seasickness. Uh, if you don't get all of those latency pieces in line, if, it, if you don't trick your mind to believing that you're somewhere else, um, and then not worry about your vestibular system as well, yeah, you, you get sick, you throw up. Um, and maybe this is an insurmountable problem. Maybe. It certainly gave VR a bad name. And through the mid-90s to late 90s, uh, a lot of the systems that touted VR really became quite unusable. So rather than the industry growing, it pretty much imploded and disappeared uh, for a fair while. There were still people using it, of course. For example, the military kept on using VR specifically, specifically for simulators, but they had millions to throw at the problem. And uh, But the entry-level le uh, versions just weren't there anymore. Entry-level now was something like 90K uh, to get a system, and they were used, usually used for uh, like an arcade or something like that, just a wow factor. Other advancements in technology as well, because VR wasn't such an issue, um, headed off in different directions. For example, the uh, the screens, rather than the screens getting less and less latency, they actually had higher latency. So a plasma screen, for example, has about a 10 millisecond latency. Now it's great for a TV. And in fact, actually, the extra lag of the, of the plasmas uh, retracting after being excited. It actually gives it a bit of a smoother feel for when things are transitioning from uh, like a movie, if somebody's moving across the screen or something like that. Uh, you don't have to be super precise and, and give a whole heap of additional refreshes. Uh, the latency and the lag in the screen itself can help with the feeling of smoothness and flow. But when we're talking about um, a 10 millisecond lag, when we're trying to get down to one or two milliseconds, you, you're dead in the water already. And so because it wasn't important, uh, the entire pathway got even worse than it was before, right. mainly because no one was really focusing on and smoothing up the entire pathway. There were still VR enthusiasts, of course, uh, but that even those numbers had dropped down to maybe you know, 300, 500 or so. Enter Palmer Lucky. So in about 2010, a uh, homeschooled, pretty bright kid really, was able to build uh, VR systems in his basement, in his mum's bedroom. And as an enthusiast, really wanted to look at the whole latency pipeline and try to figure out well, where is our VR? You know, it's now 20 years after you know, the initial outburst of, of VR coolness. And so where is it? Um, so a kid in his basement was able to run up a whole heap of different prototypes and figured out that, well, actually, it's very, very close. It's, it's a lot closer than where we were expecting it to be. And in fact, um, low-cost systems can be built 
uh, if you just have the right little components. So Palmer Lucky was the inventor that really brought across uh, the Oculus Rift, and so he started Oculus. Um, and all of a sudden, the industry takes off. So we find ourselves in the present where we have a number of viable options, cheap viable options for consumer grade virtual reality. Uh, the Rift, the Vive, even PlayStation VR is quite viable if you, if you happen to have a PS4. Viable in the sense that uh, $500 to $1,000 is now entry level and certainly cheaper than 90k previously. So VR, the way of the future. Is the future looking brighter for VR? It certainly is. It doesn't. I wouldn't say that uh, VR is is definitely here. Um, it's certainly not ubiquitous. Uh, there's far more TVs and even computers in people's houses than there is VR systems. Uh, but it's way closer than what it was before. Maybe five years or so until VR would be quite comfortably be able to be found in most houses. But what type of future is VR going to bring in? Are we going to see the Matrix, or are we going to see something like the Oasis, Oasis from Ready Player One? And I would certainly say the Oasis is a clearer vision, certainly for the nearer term. The Oasis would really just be an extension of the internet itself, as in having people play games on the internet, socialising, uh, even learning on the internet. Uh, that's all now somewhat taken for granted. And the Oasis is actually a fairly near-term vision of a lot of things that you can do on the internet just being replaced with a virtual reality. But how are we going to get there? How are we going to get to something like the Oasis? Well, for a start, the current models will just keep on increasing the immersion. For example, the pixel density for the screens is going to get better and better. The, uh, the processing power is going to get better and better to provide uh, better environments in front of our eyes. Uh, haptic feedback should be able to increase past just beyond our hands into uh, the rest of our body and maybe even bring in other senses like smell and taste. Like these, are, these are obvious things that are actually on the roadmap ready to go. As an industry we're also looking really for a killer game, something that, will, that everybody will, will talk about and say oh you've got to try this and it's almost like the, the gateway drug to be able to get into uh, VR. From the killer game and certainly with the, the explosion of the industry and getting more and more closer to saturation throughout the households, rapid environment creation, because VR is, is definitely trying to simulate real environments, the tools we have even now for developing computer games aren't really up to scratch to develop uh, the, the type of volumes and the amount of space that we require. And so the next step really would be just to create the tools to be able to have rapid environment creation. And then once that's happened and we have lots of environments and lots of people participating in the environments, we'd then be looking to extend past simulation. So rather than trying to simulate this world, we would look at uh, exploring and extending into spaces that aren't anything to do with this world. In terms of killer games, it might already be here. Beat Saber is one of the best games on VR at the moment. Just think of it as Guitar Hero mixed with lightsabers and you're in the right ballpark. It's a whole lot of fun. It's also set up next door if you're able to pop over and play it if you haven't already. And it, it certainly sold um, thousands of units by itself. So back to the concept of VR the way of the future and VR the way to the future. VR the way of the future, it seems fairly obvious to me that it is very close to being here right now and uh, will only keep on increasing. But VR the way to the future. There are a couple of things that are coming in terms of that extending past simulation concept. Simulation is to just try to simulate the real world, try to try to get us to believe that we're in a different world, but because it looks so familiar, it, it acts and feels just the same way as our real world. But once we're actually at that point, we can then start extending past that into a hyper-reality, so basically something that's greater than reality itself. We may be able to do things and be things and see things that are just not realistic. They're not ha actually present here in the physical world. So some of the physical properties we can start shedding away. Uh, a good one is potentially locomotion, or, or just motion really. 
imagine if you had the ability to teleport yourself from here into from your house into work well that would be awesome wouldn't it why wouldn't you want that uh, now the physical limits of the space in in in, the, in this case the physical reality just doesn't allow us to, to do that at the moment but if we're inventing a new reality and we can set the rules ourselves can't we just tweak and fiddle with the rules to be able to give us nice neat things like teleportation that'd be awesome with something like teleportation if people are immersing themselves in regular use of the, of the internet and you have the ability to do things like teleport it allows you to then start experiencing a reality in a different way than we do here now teleportation we kind of think well we're, we're present in a certain space and we want to teleport to another space but in fact the more and more used to teleporting you uh, you become and the more used to you uh, you are to get from one mental state to another state just by teleporting and, and presenting a different environment it allows you to start think thinking differently it allows you to, to start working differently it allows you to start collaborating differently and in fact the reality that then exists inside of VR a hyper reality starts to become more and more significantly different to then the actual reality the physical reality so once we can replicate all of the things that we can do in physical reality we don't lose anything we can still um, simulate a car we can still simulate hopping into a car and simulate driving to work but if you chose to teleport and if the systems allowed you to choose to teleport uh, then why not why couldn't you do that fly as well there's no reason why you couldn't fly so it's just a bit of an example of hyper reality once we start getting uh, used to tools that we can't do in our current reality uh, we can start then experimenting with extending past uh, past reality now as I mentioned before the other way to the future I see this as this hyper reality as as an inevitability um, but also that being in that state being in that, in that space that hyper reality we can do things that are not physically possible in the real world that will actually start leading to changes to uh, for us the way that we think the way that we act uh, to start developing concepts and ideas and thoughts and and even innovations and inventions and and so forth about how to get to the future itself so the first concept the other way of the future saying VR is, is going to be here soon the other way to the future means that there is also a, a, a future out there that is just not possible using today's physical world and physical space uh, we need people to be able to think differently act differently to be able to open up and find and dis explore and discover uh, this new future now leading on to that is really education so when I was at uni when I came up with this concept I was interested in education well actually learning in general and so let's see what happens to the learning environments to our universities and schools and so forth if we try to bring VR into the mix imagine that VR is everywhere it's ubiquitous donning a headset is, is just as easy as turning on a TV we can create almost any environment and a lot of people have gone through and created many environments lots and lots of different learning environments and so uh, for our learning space we could certainly don a headset and then join a classroom which is 30 kids you know teacher up the front sitting down at a desk and you can learn the same way as we do now because we can replicate almost anything from the real world uh, teacher asks you to pull out your textbook and you pull out your textbook and you can read alternately what you can do because we can create an environment is imagine if you're learning about the pyramids you can then teleport yourself or, or transform the environment the learning environment to be at the pyramids we can see and walk around them and maybe even stand on top of the pyramids um, and get a sense of presence a sense of scale and size of these things um, so that may be a better learning environment it may enhance your learning experience 
you can potentially even transform the uh, learning space back in time so you can see the pyramids actually being built. Maybe you can get to talk and discuss with uh, with people back there to say well, what, what, it was, what it was like living in that area. So that's one area is, is that creating the immersive environments to try to learn um, you learn historical facts and, and learn information easier. Also with VR, location isn't an issue, as in donning a headset and joining a classroom with 30 kids, that doesn't need to be the same 30 kids each time. You could actually be in a classroom with someone from West Australia or maybe even somebody from India. Uh, in a virtual space, it doesn't really matter that much. In fact, what matters more is what you are learning. If you have already learnt, uh, for example, a mathematical concept and the teacher at the moment in a, in a physical education environment has to teach you this concept again. There's no real opportunity for you to to say, oh, sorry, I already know this, I can, I can skip ahead. Um, or if at the end of the lesson you didn't quite get a concept, um, there's not really that many other opportunities to say, well, actually, I need to just redo that and redo that until I get it. But in virtual reality, you can create any learning environment and you can also split up um, all the kids by what they're interested in to learn now and and really keep them at the peak of their learning journey um, so they're always learning um, the, the next um, important concept because we're going to have um, so many kids as well uh, inside of a learning environment you can also then start offering the same concept but with different uh, different ways angles different environments and even like about learning styles. So if you're a kinesthetic learner and learning mathematical concepts, there's no reason why you can't choose to learn that same concept in a kinesthetic method, which means that you would create, a, you'd join an environment where you would play with blocks to be able to um, express mathematical terms. There's no reason why you can't do that. If there's an auditory learner, they'll, they'll join a, a completely different environment but might learn exactly the same concept. So with all these pieces in place, having um, access to different learning environments, having uh, no location limits, which means that you're on your own personalised journey, and with uh, environments tailored specifically to your learning style, there should be massive learning gains in the education system. And the whole idea is to get people to the top of their field as fast as possible. Uh, so if we're getting uh, people to the top of their field, it gives them more opportunity to be able to, uh, from the top of the field, start uh, inventing and exploring and advancing uh, society and, and opening up the future for us. So VR the way to the future is without those VR tools, without the way to create a personalised learning environment, we may not be able to get to the future that we could do with them and purely because we can accelerate and advance um, that learning journey. For others that are probably interested in that, there's a whole um, research paper on the real digital education revolution. I'll just chuck that in the show notes. So thanks Bundy IT pros and uh, those listening after the fact. Uh, this has been my little journey on VR. I hope you're at least inspired to, to get out there and give it a go. And in fact, we've got a couple of systems set up, so feel free to have a go now.